Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life. Well, it's about eight minutes into the 21st day of October 2021. And we're here once again trying to bring uh, uh, my thoughts up to do another verbal essay in our observation blog and sort of comparison, compare, well, comparing uh, observation that, that I see within, you know, the, the various contexts, uh, and this includes Lao Nation, and this is where our discussion is going to go today, continue along, it, going in more into depth into things. Before you can do anything, and, and, and you really do need an understanding. You need to understand where you're going, where you're coming. And part of where the answer to the future is often lies in the past. And again, an observation of history. Not It's not textbook history that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the observation of history. This, this is the same thing with observational psychology. The definition definitions that have already been predetermined uh, no longer matter. You use what you observe. And this becomes your uh, your, your uh, standard, if you will. And this is is, is uh, uh, equally as true with um, with dealing with Lionel in terms of his the overall understanding. And I said before, I was watching him for about five six years, uh, and he left on his uh, website his uh, YouTube. Oh. YouTube channel that uh, he's got enough information there. You can go all the way back to his day at uh, as a news anchor at WPIX and see how he has evolved in terms of his character from uh, those days to current. And <clears throat> he always talks about his days in radio, so you can sort of put some uh, truth to those words by looking at that history. And he leaves enough history there that, that that that, in terms of getting anything more, it's not necessarily necessary for me to do that anymore. Go back and sort of see. But uh, others, you should look, go to his playlist and look around, see what else is there. Go uh, into the, his past of, of Lionel Nation. You know, go through and scroll through everything. It does take a long time. You're gonna have to sit through half hour after half hour. Sometimes he did it twice a day, did the half hour. Sometimes he spent an hour going on it. I found that uh, once you go over a half hour, you start to lose people. That, 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 uh, my, my observation from discussion, from discussions that I've had with those who have viewed my videos, uh, once you go over a half hour, and a half hour for most people is stretching it they, they, in terms of the amount of information they can handle. So they can't handle more than a half hour. So you don't want to, you know, crush. It's not about demonstrating how brilliant you are uh, you don't want to crush the people who you, you're viewing the, your viewers you don't want to crush your viewers and also as a side note here that these are these rough draft essays they're not going to be edited so uh, take them as they are they are rough draft rough draft rough draft essays <clears throat> I do have a bit of fatigue today this well I have this almost every day, but now I'm fighting it more than ever uh, because uh, my sleep, even though I'm catching up, really isn't where it should be, but that's neither here nor there. We're out here now, and we're going to continue. The place Lionel is you have to understand what he's talking about and understand that, that in terms of his opposition to the terms of Marxist. That Marxism... Uh, he leaves it undefined because he doesn't know the definition of Marxism other than what the official line is. The official line is that Marxism is nothing more than a planned economy. This is what his friends tell him. So let's leave it at that and so argue the question, was the, well, what is Marxism? Well, to understand Marxism, you have to understand the history of philosophy that it occurs in. In other words, you have to look at the environment. Marxism emerged in the 1800, late 1800s uh, as a philosophy that was sitting within the called the, the, the humanistic sphere, where God was a, was eventually being put out the pasture, 
And it was now man's ingenuity who would engineer society to what it should be. You want to get rid of all the poor people? You want to resolve the problem of, of poverty? Well, you got to find out what's, what, what makes them tick, what makes them behave the way they behave. Let me just adjust the camera here for a bit and get this done right. Oh, here we go. Much better. Oh, the tripod was, a little off, was off a little bit, and I think I'm going to change the angle. Oh, well. So let me do this. Mm. I think we might have much better uh, uh, camera framing. So um, onward and upward. In other words, Marxism came out of a period in science where they thought they knew everything. They had decided that that, that the world was was sufficiently explainable, and this is a result of the work that was done by Voltaire. And I said, Voltaire really didn't do much of his, didn't do much of his own work. What he did is he paraphrased and, re, and restated things in manners that he, well, he thought was fifth, and considered everyone else around him, as does do most academics and intellectuals. The standard of an, into, of an academic and intellectual is that you can assume that everyone else around you is stupid. And I'm talking about the uh, not the insult, but rather the the capacity to think is is sufficiently absent that you now meet the definition of stupid. Uh, and this is and this is one of the reasons why women couldn't vote is because uh, at that time when the science knew everything, well, they classified women as feebly minded. The feeble minded person, if you got that label, and this is how serious it was. Why couldn't you vote? Well, as women are feeble minded, they're, they're hysterical. They they don't think they. They are about emotion and not necessarily intellectual thought. Intellectual thought is ultimate logic. And it's without passion, without uh, emotion, and the things that were considered to be feminine at this particular time. And they, the true, true women are indeed feminine. They, 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 do, they, they Most women, anyways, they too do t can tend to care about things that men simply don't care about. And a lot of it has to do with how they feel about things. It's about the emotion, not necessarily about the logic. And they would say, "Oh, well, that's so you know silly. It's you know it's all what feminine. This there will female hysteria." But go into uh, how and observe people who are who are mentally ill. These are the, in psychology. Do your observation there, and what do you see? You see people who can't deal with their emotions. There's something going on in their past that maybe they have occurred in the past or going on in the mind currently that they can't deal with in terms of their emotions. They can't wrap. They, it doesn't matter how much logic you present to the person. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter. Even when they express the logic, they can sit down and go through the entire logic of, of what's going on with them in terms of uh, uh, the, you know, the psychological reasoning. But at certain points of time, this is, an, this is true for a schizophrenic. They'll sit down and talk, uh, of several of talk, of talk will sat down and talk about their, uh, when they're in a, in a half-decent position and you've gained enough trust with them, you've had enough conversations that they're now openly talking. This usually takes about six months to a year of going out and having coffee with the person. And this, is, this is not a short time period. Uh, uh, that you finally gain their trust and they start talking about things uh, that are going on inside that they don't really let out to anybody. Uh, you, you, if you're doing therapy, you're doing maybe an hour, an hour a day with a the person, they're not going to open up. They, they, they never open up to a therapist. They always open up to a friend. And when you go in there as a friend and you sit and you spend your time and you let them talk, again, there's nothing. I, I'm not, my skills and training in terms of that form of therapy is nothing more than simply listen to observe what they're saying, be the observer, not be the interact, you know, not be the hero. In other words, pull yourself back from the situation. Uh, it's not about you, it's about them. And in this situation, they'll describe their schizophrenia. They'll describe their experiences. And they can't tell this to the doctor. They can't tell this to these, their, their, their therapist. And basically, they said, well, we've tried all these medications, but the medic what the medication does is that it just simply locks us into a room where we have this fear. And what happens is the, you ha they have these what we call hallucinations, but they see the hallucinations as real. It's ma imagine, 
uh, you know, the the mother on uh, on uh, our family nuts has been talking about how she's on very different uh, psych beds because of her panic attacks. She's now having something called very vivid dreams. Uh, and in these so-called vivid dreams, which are what, what, which is basically which is basically my lucid dreaming, I lucid dream where I'm aware of what I'm dreaming about, and the world does not seem fake. It doesn't say, "Oh, I'm I'm dreaming. I know I'm dreaming, and this is okay." Uh, a lot of people, when when they have lucid dreams, when they are, are have a vivid dream, uh, don't know that it's not real. They don't know that it, they can't tell the difference between, that they're sleeping, or they're asleep or awake. And their emotions will overrun their logic. And so if someone is fearful of something, and that thing that causes you a great amount of fear pops up, you're going to act to defend yourself. Well, this is what happens to a schizophrenic. When they see, they see whatever they see that, that sort of frightens them, it doesn't matter what the logic is, it doesn't matter what, the, what they've been told by the doctor, their emotion comes over and takes over, and they react to, they react to the situation in a defensive manner. They work to defend themselves. And the thing is, you when a person, when they are in a particular situation, the only way to deal with the situation is you have to walk them through their fear. You have to walk with them and talk with them. You have to keep the convers you have to keep the conversation going. And you yourself have to check your own fear because they're working to defend themselves and they're in, a, in a, an extremely agitated state when they're having their their, their episodes. And basically, I call it their dream. And then they're because they're dreaming while they're awake. They're perfectly awake, uh, but the dream now has begun. They're in, while they're perfectly awake. There is no uh, 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 neurochemicals that are stopping or inhibiting their movements. Uh, in other words, they don't have the uh, the sleep drugs that are going on that paralyze the body while you're sleeping. And this is what the, what, this is what sleep disorders are. And been, there's a a large study in sleep disorders. That shows that show the people that many cases that uh, the, the 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 drugs that are supposed to paralyze the body uh, while you're sleeping, so that it prevents you from moving, they don't come into play. The there is some form uh, some some form of uh, absence, and so 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 these people will will talk in their sleep. They'll get up and walk around. and They'll have full activity while they're sleeping. People have driven cars while they've slept. People, they've actually even killed people in their sleep. Believing that this is part part of well, because they saw it as part of their dream, and so what happens is that we understand that the agi the agitated state of the emotional mind is extremely power powerful and it overrides logic. Almost every single case, when you look at mental illness, the, the emotion is overriding logic, and so what happens is the again at the, at the time this, this is what still what goes on today is the doctors have this cachet. Where they believe what they're saying is true, and you cannot question their their belief or authority. I mean, a truck come by. Uh, I mean, this is the whole fight today is the, it, it, the fight over the CVD issue in terms of the vaccine and the anti vaxxers People don't realize that it's a fight. You know, it's a fight between who has the right to say what. And, you know, it, it, it's my authority is greater than this. You, you have to listen. And, and this is what the problem with police is. Instead of doing a, a an investigation, it's not about logic. I mean, this is the cases where you've seen, you know, someone actually uh, dragged down handcuffs and tased uh, for so-called breaking into a car. They had the license plate of the car. They had the license plate of the motorcycle, the supposed to getaway vehicle. They could have called in and checked to see what what, what was going on. But they didn't. They waited until after they did the check, and after they did the arrest. They, and the thing is, even after they did the arrest and they realized that they were wrong, they still charged the person with obstruction of, of, of a police officer. They charged them with obstruct. Why? Because they didn't want to admit that they were wrong. That's not logical. That's emotional. And this is what you see in the police all the time. You see the emotion overriding the logic. And so what happens is that you go back to the doctors and say, well, this is what the case is. Well, you have to present in a clinical trial. In other words, you have to put clinical data in there. Well, that doesn't that that doesn't change what we saw in terms of observation. But of course, these people are people are, are buttoned down. They're, they're law and order. They are there for a structured universe, and that's what the modernists are. The modernists are these people, and this this is what a Marxist was. They're a person who believed in structure. 
And the structure that, that basically Dar that uh, Marx came up with was basically a model of Darwin. It was Darwinism applied to humanity, humanity and how humanity should be governed. But the thing is that they missed certain aspects. So they took the generalization and pushed it forward. But the thing is it didn't come into play until basically enough people of the uh, upper class, the particulars who have been sort of following the lines of Voltaire, who call themselves a reformist, this became this beca became your uh, London School of Economics. This became what you, what your labor is. This is who who started labor unions. Uh, all these different things uh, uh, had uh, places in society that sort of moved themselves forward, and th they actually didn't come from again because of the issue of class. The suffrage was not at the upper level classes. The suffrage was, suffrage was down below. The upper upper classes didn't have to worry about work at all because they had money. The money was coming into them. It was just they didn't have anything to do, and so they got bored and <laughs> wanted something to do. And oh, here you go. We, we, women always had to do working for causes. It couldn't be seen working for nothing. So they began these marches and this and that. And it was primarily about the uh, displeasure of the. Uh, upper class women. The suffrage has, this is why there were debutantes. It, there is no working class uh, 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 lady. There's no maid or, 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 or um, uh, say a kitchen, a kitchen, a kitchen servant, you know, a cook or something like that. There's no reason for them to go, to go on parade. They can't go on parade. They can't go in, 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 in participate in these parades. Why? Because they're servants. And there were a lot of female servants, from housemaids to everything. I mean, the chambermaid, going all back to what we call the chambermaid, the chambermaid wasn't there for the for the bed for the bedroom. That was another that was another type of maid. But the chambermaid had more to do with uh, the chamber they called the bath was not well called the bathroom. And the, you see the women with the uh, particularly in the Fort Victorian era, they had these massive dresses. Well, uh, you know, when the person had to go to the bathroom, what did you do? Well, you had to have maids in there. To undress you and put you down on the toilet, and of course, there was always somebody who, uh, because the uh, royalty wouldn't do it, do it themselves. There was someone who always would wipe them and clean them up, and <laughs> I mean, very much like a nanny uh, take, taking care of a child. Uh, to underscore this, if you can never find this, uh, uh, it's Jeeves and Worcester on YouTube. This is where he would do this uh, sort of reference. Uh, you could sort of see how they behaved, and uh, the, the upper class class really didn't have much to be concerned with, but yet this is where the suffrage movement came out of, is that uh, this sort of, these women are sort of asserting the equal rights. And uh, But they never at any point in time, in terms of the suffrage movement, ever looked at the lower class people and determined that they should have their rights as well. It was always about those of a particular class. And the class had a certain understanding, they had certain um, realizations. They had uh, certain standards of intellect that sort of you needed to be have in order to be part of that society. Uh, and, and you had to understand that the common sense was common to the level or the station that you were at in life. If you had a uh, a, a low upbringing, you would always remain at the low up at the low station because you could never rise above your particular class. You could never rise above your station. And your sense would be common to that particular area. This was the whole concept behind a, a trial by your peers, was a trial by the people who that you came out of. Somebody's driving around. Uh, we haven't had it much in terms of rail traffic today, so. And a bit of, bit of rain, it's overcast right now, so there. There's, there's, once again, there's not much really to do out here except for sort of sit here and have this discussion. So those were the modernists. And so you have you have Marxism, which was basically a modernist philosophy. This is where it emerged from. They were, you would expect people who are modernists, who are of this Marxist understanding, uh, to be buttoned down loyally. They would be uh, very logical, very, you know, precise in their terminology, and Sort of anything that wasn't, if the terminology wasn't precise, it's simply rejected. 
Well, this is an observation. Observation takes a very different tone because you no longer are thinking in terms of prejudices, in terms of prejudging things. You allow the situation to determine and to dictate itself. We can sort of see how it matches up with some sort of standard, but more often than not, you'll see that the reality is far from uh, is far from what the rhetoric is. And this is the thing you need to learn is maybe learn the term rhetoric. Rhetoric is a nice philosophy. It's the theories. It is the, it, it is the ideology of what people think about. But these ideologies are very different from reality. They don't measure up in many ways. And the way this was sort of brought about, and because the academics had this position of assuming that they were their own, their own authority, you had another group pop up known as the Surrealists. These were the postmodernists who said there was no such thing as reality. So you go to the realists, and from the realists you go to the uh, to the surrealists, and then you go with the realists or with the modernists, and the surrealists with the postmodernists. And the postmodernists felt that they could take any concept, any idea, and make it their own. So that's what they did, is you now have a postmodernist Marxist. And that could be anything. As long as you were against the call the standards of society, as long as you were anti-establishment, then your approach would be conceptual, and you you'd have two fundamental approaches: to live with no particular rules and just sort of uh, be that uh, uh, called quintessential party animal, and that would be your existence going from party to party to party. Uh, you wouldn't have no formal formal. Uh, work you would pro more likely more likely not these people because they did exist. Uh, Voltaire was one of them. They lived off of people. They they sort of they, they were they were freeloaders. What we would call today as a freeloader, this is who they were. Uh, they had no form of respect. They had no form of understanding of respect. Uh, they did what they wanted when they pleased, and so on and so. On, and that's how they lived. There was another group that came out of the reformers. This is the Voltaire the Voltaire, Vol Voltaire group who believed that something more needed to be done, that, that society needed to be actively deconstructed. So they call it deconstructionism. Well, what's deconstructionism? Well, deconstructionism is BLM, Antifa. And so for, for, for a postmodernist Marxist, and this is why you had people from BLM standing up there, oh, we're Marxists. Well, they're, yes, they're Marxists, but they were postmodernist Marxists, meaning that it could be anything that they wanted it to be. And that there were no fundamental rules, and what they really were is they were anarchists uh, who believed in the, the the perspective of deconstruction. That this was deconstructionism. That they were actively vandalizing, deconstructing society. This is who the anarchists are, and they've always been used in in, in political battles on one side or the other. Or even in both cases, each side would have their own anarchists. And we saw this. Well, we have Antifa and, and BLM. On the right, you had uh, the Proud Boys. And there's a number of different reasons why these people would do what they do. And again, you'd have to go in and do the observation and psychological analysis in order to find out particular reasons why someone does what they do. And so there is a way to go in depth more. There is a way to bring up a larger observation of uh, the, the political goings-on in terms of the psych psychological uh, makeup, the behavior, you can observe all of this. You, you just have to sit through enough materials and look at enough people. And fortunately for me, uh, this was uh, Lionel. Lionel brought in a lot, large chunk of the, so the contrarian so that you could contrast his con contrary, his opinions against both the left and the right. So you had in one person, you had uh, this sort of analysis that you could do. Uh, but now he says he's bowing out. He's only going to be doing an eight, uh, like 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 a eighteen minute uh, meal every day, which is all right. But he's going to be focusing more more on Lionel dot com. Otherwise, he's going behind a subscription wall, like like Alex Jones and others have all gone behind the subscription wall. And if you're willing to pay for it, then go ahead, you know, pay for. It. But I'm going to remain free. I'm going to not go behind the subscription wall. But then again, I'm not. I'm a nonconformist, and so. I typically don't do. I don't follow the crowd. I'm not a trendy person, so uh, it's going to be here, and 
uh, I'll figure out how I get paid from here on out. So it's, uh, it's not, for me, it's not much of an issue. Anyways, if you like this type of content, you like Lionel, and all these people are going behind pay subscription wall, but you don't either feel like paying for it or don't have the funds to pay for it, but like the content, well, I'm going to be your replacement. I'm going to be the replacement for Lionel. I'm going to be a replacement for Alex Jones and or, or any of these sides. But the thing is, I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to scream. We're going to take an approach from the perspective of a researcher. That's what I am. I'm a researcher. I'm not going to be there as a lawyer. So I want to take the observational approach. And this is what this is. It's observational. We're doing observation out here. This is how we approach the issues. Anyways, uh, I think that's it for now. And uh, I will see you uh, tomorrow night for the... Uh, uh, next iteration of the observation blogs. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life.